Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you uh, for coming here this morning to this uh, breakfast sponsored by the New America Foundation and Foreign Policy. We have with us uh, Min Shin Pei from the Carnegie Endowment and Andres Martinez from the New America Foundation. Uh, and they promise to entertain you uh, with a morning smackdown on the subject of Asia's inevitable rise and whether it is or not. <laughs> uh, I thought I would introduce uh, first Min Shin, who has written this uh, terrific uh, and very argumentative and provocative piece for the new issue of Foreign Policy magazine, uh, which I invite you all to grab a copy of uh, outside if you haven't already. Uh, the piece is called Think Again, Asia's Rise, uh, and I think is a, is a great uh, representation of why Min Shin is such a is such a powerful force in his field. He is. Uh, Let's see, his official title is Senior Associate uh, in the China Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he has written widely on uh, democratization, uh, on China. He's the author of From Reform to Revolution, uh, The Demise of Communism in China and the Soviet Union, and China's Trapped Transition, The Limits of Developmental Autocracy. Uh, he's been widely published in his field. and. Uh, we know him to be uh, a terrific writer as well as a, a real uh, forceful advocate uh, uh, for a point of view that deserves your attention and thoughts. Anders is the head of the Bernard Schwartz Fellows Program here at New America, and I'm sure many of you all know him, uh, and has promised uh, to offer today, uh, what's the right phrase since this is the Supreme Court uh, conclusion day, uh, a concurring in part and dissenting in part uh, <laughs> opinion. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, on Minchin's very provocative seven assertions about uh, whether the Asia's rise is just as inevitable as it's often made out to be. I thought, since uh, uh, Minchin probably won't do it himself, that I would start the discussion off today actually by reading his his very forceful uh, first couple paragraphs from this piece, which I think is a pretty good uh, frame. Uh, setter for the conversation that I hope we can have. Uh, we'll go back and forth uh, this morning between Anders and uh, Minchin and then hopefully engage all of you in questions and I hope that you've brought a lot of questions for them this morning. Uh, so the piece starts out, uh, you know, really I think right in the in the center of things uh, by suggesting that uh, power is not necessarily shifting from west to east in the way that you might imagine. Uh, of course, if you dine on a steady diet of books like The New Asian Hemisphere, The Irresistible Shift of Global Power to the East, or When China Rules the World, uh, or fill in your own stack. I'm sure you all have a pile of these books that you've seen in the bookstore or on your own shelves. Uh, it's easy to think that the future belongs to Asia. As one prominent herald of the region's rise put it, quote, we are entering a new era of world history, the end of Western domination and the arrival of the Asian century. Sustained rapid economic growth since World War II, writes Minchin, has undeniably boosted the region's economic output and military capabilities. But it's a gross exaggeration to say that Asia will emerge as the world's predominant power player. At most, Asia's rise will lead to the arrival of a multipolar world, not another unipolar world. Minchin, maybe you can tell everybody to start to what you meant by that. Well, uh, if you think about the sort of the Asian century in terms of our understanding of the American century. The, the last century was the American century. And then you, you have to ask yourself a few questions. Will Asia be able to shape the world the way the US shaped the world in the, uh, in the 20th century? The answer that I can come up is no, because it's very unlikely that Asia will have the capabilities and the skills to remake the world order, because the US did remake the world order after World War II. Uh, and uh, also, if you look at Asia as a whole, uh, and then uh, uh, look at the relationships between various major Asian players, then you would say it's, re it's a region full of rivalry, mm -hmm. full of underlying conflict, and then uh, the, the aggregate gains in power for Asia will most likely be neutralized by the, uh, the, uh, the intra-regional conflict or rivalry. So the net effect Asia has on the world, on, on influence of the world, can be fairly small. 
uh, unlike the U.S. because when the U.S. emerged on the world scene as a very powerful player, there was there was national cohesion. There was, uh, of course, after a period of isolationism, the country's political elite did get together and actually had a very purposive action uh, plan. If you ask uh, Asian leaders whether well, what their idea, ideal notion of a world order is, mm -hmm. you're going to come up with several, not one. One thing that struck me as very powerful in your in your argument is how connected in many ways this is with the the American narrative of power. Uh, you know that this is not a conversation that exists in isolation, but it's very much intertwined uh, with the current uh, wave of sort of American decline uh, conversation, and that in a lot of ways this piece is as much about that as it is about uh, Asia per se. Do you, do you oh, agree yeah. with that? Well, I, I think it's uh, sort of subconsciously connected with that because in the middle of this financial uh, and economic crisis, and then when you look at Asia, Asia is doing relatively better mm -hmm. than the U.S. And uh, uh, so it's uh, easy to uh, refer to that subcon uh, subcontext. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Again, I, I think uh, because I have lived in this country for that long, uh, so I now tend to look at things uh, more from the U.S. perspective. Mm -hmm. Anders, where is Minchin uh, leading us astray? Well, first of all, um, <coughs> thank you for, for doing this and for having this event and inviting me. Um, before I got here, I actually thought we were going to discuss the death of Macho, another piece <laughs> <laughs> in, this, uh, in this issue, which is very good. Um, and I have to plug it because one of our New America fellows wrote it. Um, but I, which is very much connected to the Asia conversation. So. Yes. And I actually watched Mad Men last night to prepare for the Macho thing. But um, no, in, in all seriousness, uh, you know, this is a very uh, rich subject, and I do think it plays into the discussion about the... Uh, the, America, the decline of whether you know, America is in decline or not. And so I, I, I brought it up somewhat teasingly, but it's, it's true that I, I think I have sort of four issues with the piece, um, and two of them would be sort of strong concurrences. I, 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 I think Minchin is right that the, uh, the narrative uh, of American decline is, is overblown, this idea that uh, we're gonna, the U.S. is going to emerge from the crisis in a much weakened state, I think, is something that is going to prove to be uh, inaccurate. Um, I also completely agree with the notion that it, it makes little sense to talk about Asia as one entity. Um, you know, people take quibble about whether you can talk about Europe as a, a single entity on the global stage, and I think that's a much closer call. Um, I think it's almost a bit of a straw man to say that this is overblown because in all seriousness, you can't talk about a disparate region that encompasses Pakistan and Korea and China and Japan with all the rivalries inherent as, as a single entity that's going to take on anybody other than themselves. Um, so I, I completely concur that those are their necessary correct, corrective uh, arguments. Um, where I would dissent and where we can have a livelier uh, exchange, um, because I would sort of take disagree a bit. I think the revisionism of, of the piece is a bit overstated in minimizing the overall uh, economic force of Asia, insofar as it uh, some t you know there's a temptation to take a look at this as a static snapshot and minimize where China is today, for example, in terms of per capita income compared to the U.S. and the fact that it's going to take 77 years to catch up. Uh, and looking at sort of the share of the global pie. Um, because I think leverage in today's world comes from sort of the last marginal dollars that get spent. And there's something, you know, growth gives you leverage, you know, whether it's uh, in how you value a, a company in the stock market or whether you're talking about the power of uh, countries on the global stage. Um, you know, if, if uh, I read over the weekend and somewhere else the, this factoid that India and China account for more than half of all new subscriptions to wireless devices in the world. Um, so however much catching up there is to be done, you know, directional growth and that uh, gives you tremendous leverage. So if you're China and you, you can determine whether commodity prices are going to go up or down depending on whether you're going to grow 6% or 10% 
in a quarter, and if you have the power to determine whether, if your market's going to determine whether Nokia or Boeing or Coca-Cola are going to make their quarterly earnings, there's a lot of leverage that comes there that I think is, is uh, and for this reason, China has preoccupied us a lot more than Japan for a long time, because it's not necessarily the baseline that, that affects your, your ability to exert economic power in the world. It's kind of where you're headed. Um, and then my, the, the, on the fourth issue, and my, my second uh, quibble with the piece would have to do with the sort of zero-sum uh, notion of the, you know, nature of the argument, you know, the sort of classic who's on top, who's going to dominate uh, in the, you know, on the global s stage going forward. Um, and I think one of the things that's a little bit lost and that I would love to hear your thoughts on is whether you feel, uh, I understand that the, the hype about Asia as a competitor power is overblown, but I wonder what your thoughts on whether the hype about the centrality of the G2 relationship is overblown. Mm -hmm. Because on that front, I would, you know, I would pile onto the hype and, and add more to it. I mean, I, and, I, and so I think that, you know, to say, is this, is this next century going to be an American century or an Asian century? I do think there's a lot to the notion that, you know, there's a, uh, a mutual dependence that has emerged that is very clear and in some ways enables the United States to perpetuate another American century. Um, so I, I, rather than East versus West, in some ways the Pacific and that relationship, to my mind, is a way for the United States to continue to, to play the, this role in the global economy by, you know, not stopping in California, but it's still part of the sort of westbound progression of, of American. Um, and I think there's a, the, the, the complementary nature of these two economies is something we've never quite seen before when talking about potential rivals on the, on the global stage. And so I, we can come back to that, but that's, th those are sort of my reactions to the piece. Yeah, I want to respond to the first issue you raised, that is uh, uh, growth, uh, can be a very powerful leverage. Uh, there is a two ways I want to respond. First is that uh, when we think about growth in the future, uh, at least in the current hype, uh, we uh, tend to assume that growth will continue. Uh, I question that assumption because uh, we all know economic uh, growth is a very uncertain process. And if you factor in uh, enormous challenges China and India uh, and Southeast Asia will face uh, in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, I, I personally uh, am very skeptical that uh, you can assume 7, 9% growth for these very big economies uh, for an extended period of time. Uh, second is that uh, to what extent uh, have we seen that China in particular, has been able to leverage its growth uh, as a, an instrument of power, uh, especially in terms of technology. So far, uh, we have not seen a great deal of progress. I'm not saying there is no progress. If you look at uh, wireless, uh, something you referred to, uh, the, uh, the codes are still written, uh, developed by Nokia outside of China. They are rolling out new models in China. Uh, and if you look at where China, uh, how the profit is shared, the development, uh, the profit still goes, the bulk of the profit still goes to Western companies. And here, there's a point that I made in the piece, which, uh, the, we might uh, revisit, uh, right? That is, to what extent Asia will become a technological leader in the future? Mm -hmm. Because you can have most of the growth, but the profit, the real economic benefits, can actually accrue to somebody who has the best ideas. And uh, I, uh, I'm not minimizing Asia's, uh, again, as a whole, Asia's innovation, a Asia's capabilities in the future. Uh, but when you look at innovation uh, uh, and where it comes from, uh, it, tend to, uh, it tends to come from an entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so far, uh, again, my view can be very distorted and limited. 
uh, I still believe the U.S. has the best ecosystem for innovation. And for Asia, that kind of ecosystem simply does not exist today. And unless they can change their culture, they change the political system, really the entire Asian way of life, it's very hard for Asia to recreate uh, the American ecosystem of innovation. They can, uh, they, they have the money, they can build, they can endow $30 billion for a new Harvard, but, uh, and they can actually buy all the Harvard professors, <laughs> but they're all with it in Asia. <laughs> Well, one factor we haven't discussed uh, is the question of the political role uh, in shaping the outcome in particular with future growth. One of the core assumptions uh, of the Asia's future dominant school of thinking is, is the notion that this growth is going to continue at these dramatic trajectories. And I think one of the things that, that Minchin lays out in his piece fairly compellingly is the idea that assuming uh, political stability uh, across a region with such diverse uh, problems is is risky at best uh, for uh, for an analyst. What do you make of the chances that uh, serious political disruption occurs in China elsewhere in the region right now? Well, you look at uh, there's this uh, failed index, uh, failed state failed index, state. Mm -hmm. uh, and China is on it. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I saw uh, uh, that's. Not where China belongs. China should belong of the, the index of rising states. <laughs> uh, not just, well, my specialty is China, with, so I'll leave China toward the end. If you look at Asia, I mean, North Korea clearly is a waiting, is a ticking time bomb. It's Pakistan is another. Mm -hmm. So I mean, any uh, military conflict. Mm -hmm. Uh, which, of course, agency. Pakistan yeah, uh, affects India, in, uh, in, which in China, dramatically affects and China. And North Korea mm -hmm. affects the entire Northeast Asia mm -hmm. uh, trading zone. Uh, and then talking about China, uh, right. leaving aside whether China will uh, descend into chaos, mm -hmm. China does have one speed bump ahead. That mm -hmm. is, uh, right now, it is a one-party state. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point, it will become a democracy. We don't know how long it will take. And uh, on the world form, uh, that transition uh, will, uh, will be. Uh, but the factors that made China grow very fast for the last 30 years probably will disappear when China becomes a very decentralized democratic state. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, even, uh, if chi uh, even if China successfully becomes a democracy, it's very likely to be a relatively weak democracy. And uh, as a result, its economic uh, growth performance probably will no longer be as fast. I'm not saying that democracy leads to, mm -hmm. by just of a, the, a, as a rule, weak economic performance. But Can in I the Chinese context, that, uh, uh, that change, that political change, would definitely, will, will most likely lead to a weak form of economic performance. <laughs> Anders, do you agree? Um, well, I, you know, it's funny. I was over the weekend. I was I was looking at Fox Butterfield's book that came out in 1982. That yes, <coughs> they got us all jazzed up. And, mm -hmm. You know about China. A lot of us. Uh, I was. Uh, I think I spent my. I, I spent my, my the summer after my freshman year of college in in Beijing. This was 1985. Um, yeah. And I think largely as a result of reading that book. Um, and I, <laughs> it's funny to go back and, and look at it because. You know, he ends with you know po pos posing the question of what you know, what is to become of China going forward, and one of the big questions is: Is this country going to be able to feed itself? And I think it's it was sort of a, a good reminder of, of you know how far we've come. Um, and I, this this argument about you know this is not sustainable; that these rates of growth are not sustainable. We hear every every few yes. years, and yet it turns out they are sustainable. And even yeah. with this huge crisis that we've gone through. You know, we're we're, see, we're starting to see that uh, there's a, quite a bit of resilience in the mm -hmm. Chinese economy, and they're not taking a, a hit similar to many other developing countries. There's a sort of corrective aspect that even as exports out of China are down, uh, consumption in China has increased dramatically in the last year. A lot of it's government spending, but not not all of it. Um, so I'm a little bit, you know, puzzled by when this locomotive runs out of steam and I, and I think I'm, I'm actually a little bit optimistic given 
as you point out in the piece, the fact that there is still so much room for growth in terms of catching up to our standards. Um, and you know, the same uh, <coughs> data sets that are pointed at as potential stumbling blocks, the fact that you have this divide between uh, you know, the cities and the hundreds of millions of, of people in the countryside who, who are still lag far behind, you know, those are also arguments in favor of you know, the, the room to, to grow and the fact that there's so much to, to advance. Um, and whether democratization could eventually become a hindrance to growth, which is another uh, argument we hear from time to time, um, and one I'm very conflicted about because we all want to be on the side of, of democratization, but we also want to be on the side of 10% GDP growth in China. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, you, you visit China and you talk to young cosmopolitan folks, the, the, the generation that, that you know, is, uh, grew, grew up completely hooked, linked into sort of Western culture in a way that the previous generations did not. And I don't get a sense from them that there's a tremendous appetite for uh, decentralization of the central government or, you know, multi-party democracy. And again, that's, that's a bit puzzling too. So there does seem to be tremendous buy-in into the idea that you know, growth for the sake of growth. And, you know, that's, it's a little bit uh, disappointing for sort of an American sensibility. But the extent, I, I'm not sure exactly where the, uh, the landmines are going ahead in terms of the potential for. I also think there's something that we don't um, pay close enough attention to when it comes to China in terms of what differentiates it from a lot of other emerging markets and around the world. And the fact that you know, over the last quarter century, uh, the fact that China has not suffered the kind of bust and boom cycles that we've seen elsewhere, you know, whether it's Mexico or Turkey or um, a lot of these other countries. And I, and I think the role of the Chinese diaspora across Asia as to serve as a sort of shock absorber is, is a, a story that we, we don't quite understand sufficiently. And so while I think it is, you know, uh, distortive to talk about Asia as an entity. Um, there is something larger than just the PRC um, that we often don't, aren't mindful enough of. And I'm, I'm referring to the sort of role of, of Taiwan and Hong Kong and ethnic Chinese communities and Singapore and Malaysia to, to finance um, a lot of what's happened in China. I mean, we, the narrative typically is Deng Xiaoping woke up one day in the mid-80s and said, let's open up after decades of of being closed off from the world, and lo and behold, the PRC pulled it off. And what gets lost in that story is the tremendous reservoir of capital and know-how that was on the sidelines, ready to, to play a role that, in a way that other emerging markets didn't, mm -hmm. didn't couldn't benefit from. Well, yeah, uh, can I just uh, have a quick uh, rejoinder? Well, uh, I'm uh, also a big fan of Fox Butterfield's book. Uh, I think uh, if you compare optimists and pessimists, what you find is that pessimists are always right. <laughs> Eventually. In terms of substance. <laughs> Sooner or later. They're, they can, uh, they're wrong in terms of timing. Right. <laughs> so, so I think... Uh, uh, That's right. The people who are predicting a crash for the last five years, if you just keep yes, doing right. it... Keep doing it, you Sooner always... Or later. You, you, you look at the people who have forecast this uh, the ongoing economic crisis. And, <laughs> They, 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 they identified all the problems many years ago. Uh, and of course, uh, the, as for the landmines lying ahead, I, uh, I'm not a self-promoter, but I do it uh, uh, here for, uh, to break my own rule. I uh, had a debate with uh, uh, an economist called Jonas Anderson in a rival magazine, The National Interest, uh, and uh, I had a laundry list. So I, uh, I refer you to... Uh, to visit that uh, that piece. It's, uh, uh, may, may in the case of China, I think its success and its performance was un underpredicted uh, for the last 30 years. And we can actually I mean, commit the opposite mistake <laughs> in that based because we underpredict right. China's success. Now uh, we're overpredicting its success. One thing that I think is, is striking about this is there at heart is a real debate here about whether there is a big idea behind uh, China's and uh, more broadly uh, Asia's economic growth. And that's, that's, that's something that Minchin addresses in the piece uh, and that in a way, Anders, what, what you're saying suggests 
is is growth in and of itself an ideology? Uh, is is it or is is it a tactic? Is it an outcome? that we prefer? Is there something unique uh, and particular uh, that has evolved uh, in the way that China has grown over the last couple decades that, that suggests um, a model for a state? Is it a form of economic and political governance or is it, uh, in other words, is it a new ideology or is it actually uh, an outcome of some successful tactics? Well, my, my favorite line in Minchin's piece was the, the line of self-confidence is not an ideology. Yes, uh, yeah, that's because I think that sums this up very well. Um, and, I, and this is actually one of the reasons why, um, to answer the question, no, I don't think there's, some, there's a great um, innovative alternative worldview ideological framework that is challenging sort of you know, the, the American worldview that has animated the, the last century. And, that, and that's actually why I take issue with the, the sort of notion that this has to be a zero-sum game and a rivalry, and, I, and why the, I think the G2 is such a complementary relationship and symbiotic one, and one that benefits the United States at the end of the day. Because mm -hmm. even, even in contrast to sort of our, our close relationship with Europe, uh, where I think there is a bit of a, a, a sort of competition of ideas and, and different sensibilities, uh, you know, here we are with the nominally communist uh, People's Republic of China, and it is, uh, you know, there, there's no reason why this should be, you know, there should be uh, friction ideologically, given the sort of mutuality of interests. I mean, we used to be engaged in this uh, decades long, you know, mad, mutually assured destruction kind of brink, brinksmanship with the Soviet Union, and we have a different kind of mad here. It's just mutually assured dependence. and. It's something I think that both elites in both countries feel very uncomfortable with and are very uh, wary about acknowledging open, you know, openly, and the politics could actually get in the way of fulfilling the promise of this relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I agree that, the, that uh, I don't see this great challenge to sort of our American worldview emerging out of Asia. I, I completely agree with that, and, and I think that actually adds to the strength of the codependence. Mm -hmm. Well, gross. Uh, started out as a tactic mm -hmm. uh, for the four dragons, for Japan. It was a tactic to catch up, to fight communism. For China, it was a tactic to save communism. <laughs> right. uh, and, uh, and gradually evolved into an end itself, into mm -hmm. some growth uh, as ideology. Right. And if you look at uh, us Asian elites, how are you going to uh, solve your problems, social problems? You get one growth. growth will grow out of our problems. Mm -hmm. Even though, ironically, you, you look at many of the problems uh, in Asia, they're problems of growth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you compound problems caused by growth by growing, uh, by growing even more and even faster. Uh, so that's, uh, 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 that's where I think the conundrum mm -hmm. for Asia is. Another thing is that if you look at, uh, again, I'm f familiar with the Greater China uh, region and its culture. Uh, it's a region that has no dominant religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And growth and money making has become the religious substitute. Mm -hmm. So it has that kind of power that motivates, energizes mm -hmm. the entire society. And the third point uh, here it related is that it's really self confidence is amazing. Mm -hmm. that the, This shows the Asians can do it. The Asians now have mastered the secret of Western civilization. Right. That is, we know how to build buildings, build it better, cheaper, faster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and higher. When you go to right. the, the higher, yeah, of course, cheaper, now. Faster. Yes, and then mm -hmm. higher, and then mm -hmm. all the sort of tallest buildings are in Asia. And that, it, throughout the region, that the self-confidence is inescapable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You sort of walk right up to this line in the piece, but uh, I'm going to try to push you even farther here. Uh, do you believe that there would have been even greater economic success in these societies had they been free over the last few decades? And, you know, secondly, whether you think that or not, is there a role uh, for human rights, as it seems to be quaintly oh. called, uh, that doesn't yeah. seem to have a place in this conversation? Oh, absolutely, because I think uh, economic success is very hard to measure. Uh, how do you measure? Uh, because certain 
uh, a just society mm -hmm. has intangible assets that are not economic. I think uh, I challenge people to tell me how much it is worth to have a vote, mm -hmm. to have your vote counted. Mm -hmm. How much it is worth to sleep in peace, not worrying about being hauled away by the secret police in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. I think an Indian does not have that fear. A Chinese, a Chinese citizen, <laughs> most <laughs> Chinese ordinary people don't have that fear. A Chinese citizen has that fear. So, uh, and then, how, uh, uh, how do you measure uh, the personal happiness, satisfaction of more equitable distribution of income benefits? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I think it's not necessarily more economic success, but a bet much better social achievements mm -hmm. uh, would have been uh, attained uh, in places like China uh, had there been more democracy, mm -hmm. more human rights, more it, rule of law. You, you mentioned uh, China was at the very bottom of this list of potentially failed states that we do every year that's in the same issue of the magazine. There's the suggestion that certainly that, that some researchers have made that uh, in and of itself uh, political repression is a, is a form of economic instability for a country. Uh, that if you have an overly high level of political repression in a society, that is uh, a dangerous foundation on which to, to build your economy. I, and I'm wondering uh, what each of you thinks about that. Um, well, you know, I, I think... Um, it's true that, uh, to Minchin's earlier point, it's hard to, uh, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of aspects to our fulfill individual fulfillment that aren't measured by economic statistics. And, uh, you know, the role that human rights ought to play in this discussion is, uh, you know, is not one I, I want to completely set aside. Um, on the other hand, y you know, I do think that Along, along with this tremendous economic success over the last few decades and a willing kind of acknowledgement by the leadership in Beijing that, you know, we're going to play this American game, if we want to define it that way, of, you know, faster, cheaper, more efficiently, but, you know, sort of playing this, this game of capitalism. Along with that, it, it, there hasn't just been, you know, tr spectacular GDP growth. Uh, there has been a tremendous expansion of individual liberty and freedom and I, I would call them perhaps it's it's safer to call it personal autonomy in China uh, I mean I, you know go back to the 80s and you know your life as a Chinese citizen was determined by your downway in terms of where you could live and work and a lot of the decisions that you make in terms of your life are you are now your own and they're not the parties it's true that there is still that last maybe couple of steps about determining who's going to lead your country, and that's not an insignificant um, choice and decision. Uh, but, you know, there, there has been tremendous change in terms of the nature of, of one's ability to, f to live one's life and, and also to connect to the rest of the world and travel and study abroad and for, you know, for the elites, to be sure. Um, and, again, I think one of the things that's perplexing for, for us here is, you know, at what point does this demand for the final step um, along this progression and the demand for uh, multi-party democracy, which, I mean, you're starting to see a lot of, you know, democracy with a, a small letter D at, at the local level and a lot of sort of what we would consider grassroots activism across China on things like land rights and environmental issues um, that would have been unimaginable 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but clearly the repressive nature of the party at the national level and its monopoly of power, I mean, I, I do think that has to be the asterisk, asterisk to every kind of bullish statement I, I make. Um, yeah. Even though, again, the young generation of Chinese that you talk to, uh, they're, you know, where did the Tiananmen spirit go? I don't know. It's, yeah. Well, uh, repression, uh, uh, in China, it's not it's what I would call select repression. It's not mass repression. Uh, the government targets certain segments of society. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, repression itself produces victims. In, on the Mao's China, it produced a lot of victims. Now it, it's producing fewer victims. 
Another form of repression is the repression of, of historical memory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that actually probably creates more problems for the Chinese Communist Party than its current repression. Uh, because the version of history and the version of the party's legitimacy mm -hmm. uh, that's produced is a very distorted one. So to, uh, one of the uh, genre uh, uh, the books that tend to get censored in China today are mm -hmm. books about history, mm -hmm. not about the present uh, society in China. And another form of repression is economically related. That is, uh, given the political monopoly enjoyed by the Communist Party, it uses that monopoly to distribute wealth through all kinds of through. Uh, seizure of private property and so forth. And that kind of repression actually creates a lot of victims mm -hmm. uh, today. So uh, in other words, future political stability will depend on evaporation of this, uh, the possible evaporation of this uh, big lie, the big lie about China's future, mm -hmm. uh, about China's past. And also when the victims who uh, have lost their property or their uh, uh, economic interests as a result of political repression rise up. And tell us a little bit more about, about the big lie. Uh, what specifically oh. do you think is, is, is the bright line there, and how is it shaping a broader uh, new ideology? Yeah. I would say, uh, uh, I, I, I would say practically everything. The, uh, the history of the party, the history of the People's Republic, some defining events, defining moments. It's define its leaders, I mean, uh, their personal stories. A lot of them, the dark, uh, the dirtiest the secrets have not come out mm -hmm. in China. I've uh, studied the collapse of the former Soviet Union. And one of the most powerful contributors sure. to this rapid evaporation of legitimacy Glasnost. was Glasnost, yeah. because during Glasnost, all the atrocities committed by Stalin, by the Communist Party, came out. Mm -hmm. So day after day, uh, the Soviet public woke up to hear and read <laughs> another uh, part uh, of, the, of their parties, of their government's uh, dirty past. Mm -hmm. uh, and in China, for example, very uh, the, the party has done such a great job of whitewashing history. Mm -hmm. uh, it, most of uh, the younger people on the 30 do not know what Tiananmen was. Tian, uh, very few people know that more than 30 million people died of the famine mm -hmm. uh, in the early 60s. And they did not know that the Communist Party uh, 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 the, killed a lot of people in the early 50s when it uh, came to power. So a lot of uh, very tragic stories are waiting to come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the moment they came out, uh, I wonder how the party is legitimacy is going to fare. Hmm. That's a very powerful point. And of course, the postscript in Russia today is uh, the effort to uh, re rewrite yes. that history. And yeah. uh, there's been a systematic uh, purging of the yeah. new generation of liberal history textbooks, for example, yes. uh, that came out in the wake of the Soviet collapse. And today, yeah. you once again can no longer read the, the accurate history. Yeah. Well, in, in China, just one a quick point. For a long time, I wonder whether it's still, probably still today, school textbooks still claim that South Korea invaded North Korea mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> and started the Korean War. I mean, how still can you deal with that. it? Yeah. Still say that. Yeah. Yeah. Great example. <laughs> Well, listen, I want to thank everybody for their, for their patience for the, uh, uh, this part of the program. And now we want you to, uh, to engage with us and ask questions. I'll ask you just to uh, stand up and identify yourself, uh, where you're from, and give us your question. But we're, we're eager to hear you. So, please. There in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Damien Tompkins, and I'm uh, from the United Council. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Damien Tompkins, and I'm from the Atlantic Council. Um, my question concerns China's growth regarding energy acquisition and uh, possibly climate, climate change, uh, comparing it to the U.S., which, who is better adapted to deal with, with climate change, and, and what are your thoughts on that? 
And regarding just energy acquisition for China's continued economic growth, do you have any thoughts that you could share on that to both panelists, please? Thank you. Well, I guess in Washington, everybody is an expert, even though <laughs> <laughs> you should uh, always be very skeptical uh, when uh, somebody appears to know everything. Uh, I'm, I don't know a whole lot about the energy field, uh, but this is what I know. Uh, China will, I mean, compared with the U.S., probably is a more poorly positioned to deal with climate change than the U.S., not because the U.S., is a more affluent society because the China's energy mix makes it a lot harder. China depends uh, uh, on burning coal. I mean, 80% of its electricity generation comes from coal burning, and that releases a lot of CO2. Uh, and, uh, uh, but of course, the Chinese government appears to be more proactive in this uh, area because uh, uh, not purely of climate change, uh, the climate change threat, because burning coal is very, very dirty, and it causes enormous pollution within, uh, within China. Uh, and they're also worried about energy security, uh, uh, because they, uh, they, they can, China does not have the means to defend its ceilings of communication. The U.S. has. Mm -hmm. So China has to have a plan to deal with this over-reliance on foreign oil. And uh, this only energy acquisition, uh, I think that's part of the plan because China sees securing access to energy supply, especially oil, uh, as crucial to its national security. Um, you do a good job sounding like an expert. Um, and I, you know, again, I think on I also don't pretend to know the ins and outs of the sort of climate uh, change negotiations. And um, I do think, though, that the whole question of, of uh, global warming and uh, energy security are examples of ways in which uh, the relationship between China and the United States is sort of the, the indispensable factor in global growth and in any kind of global governance. Um, you know, uh, obviously the U.S. and China are in very different positions in terms of being able to embrace uh, ambitious uh, uh, emissions reduction uh, schemes, and, and it had you know in our in our part it might be more to do with willingness, and in China's on China's part it might have to do more to do with capacity. But what is clear is that for anything meaningful to happen on a global scale. Um, China and the U.S. have to be on board. I mean, that kind of sets the lowest common denominator. And it's, you know, the two countries alone produce about half of all emissions. Um, I think on oil as well, there's a, there's a tendency, I think, to think too much about, in terms of a zero-sum competitive, you know, if you watch Lou Dobbs, oh my gosh, you know, China just, you know, made a $10 billion deal with Petrobras in Brazil and they're buying up copper mines in Chile and, you know, they're taking over the world. Um, but I, I, I tend to be, uh, you know, maybe I'm, I'm just a little uh, too, too optimistic, but I, I think this creates an asymmetry. You know, it aligns our interest more to the point about the sea lanes. Um, you know, if there really was a disruption uh, in terms of the flow of oil uh, to, to Europe, to Asia, you know, I think it would kind of serve as a waking call that we're kind of all in this together. I mean, I, I was more worried about, you know, China's designs on the world when it was self-sufficient when it came to oil and, and even sort of a modest exporter not too long ago. Um, so that's mm -hmm. Next question. Here in the front. Thank you, Rob Warren, Foreign Service Institute. I'd like to ask a two-pronged question. The first one concerns what I think is perhaps the greatest challenge right now for the complementarity between our countries, the U.S. and China, and that is the structural reform that both countries need to make, particularly in China. Will it be able to boost consumption and reduce its drive for export expansion? The second one, are we doing enough to extend that complementarity? Is the administration uh, doing what it needs to do to dialogue with China, and what would you suggest to strengthen that dialogue? Hmm. Well, that's an interesting uh, yeah. question, especially as you don't hear too much about uh, 
President Obama has not exactly focused on this relationship yet. Yeah, well, he's, uh, uh, he's committed. He has good people uh, working for him on the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, Hillary Clinton's, one of her first stops uh, uh, was China. Uh, I would say the uh, demonstration is uh, doing a decent job in reaching out to the Chinese. You look at uh, Hillary Clinton was there, now Jim Steinberg's there, uh, Jim, uh, Tim Geithner uh, has been there, and they're going to have the first stri combined strategic economic dialogue and so-called senior dialogue encompassing diplomatic and economic uh, issues uh, at the end of next month. Uh, so I think in, the out, in terms of outreach, uh, the relationship in, is in very good form. The problem is structural adjustment. Because for the American structural adjustment to take place, it means hardship for China. <laughs> because the Americans will consume fewer Chinese products. Uh, and the, for China, the, struct, uh, the structural adjustment uh, will actually have uh, being a positive sum game for everybody. The problem for China uh, is how, uh, in order to raise consumption, you have to raise income. And raising individual income is a lot more difficult because the Chinese people, you say, oh, they are saving a lot, they're not spending. Part of the story is true, but if you look at the share of GDP uh, that goes to individual income that share has been falling. So how do you reverse that trend? That means cutting the income that flows to government-owned companies and try to uh, uh, raise farmers' income. And these policy adjustments involve a lot of politics. And I don't know whether the Chinese government is ready to, uh, uh, ready to take on powerful interest groups in China in order to have those effective policies carried out. I think the, um, I mean, I, I do think they're, they're, the crisis has served to focus everyone's attention. And some of the, you know, at the margins, some structural adjustment, adjustment is taking place insofar as we see savings rate in the U.S. dramatically spike up. Consumption rates in China go up. Uh, clearly, that's, it's a, it's a, much larger subject than that, and the challenge, as Minchin said, is um, bringing up income levels in, in China. I, I do tend to think that the the, the uh, imbalances are overstated on the on the trade side. Um, I think so much of this is is sort of the merging of two economies, and a lot of what gets baked into the trade figures have to do with the supply chains of U.S. multinationals. So, um, on the current account side more broadly defined and sort of the creditor-debtor relationship, I think that structural um, imbalance is, is more serious and, and we're going to constantly see this game of, you know, the reserve currency and one of the levers that, that Beijing can always go back to is as a, their <coughs> central bank president I think has done in the last couple of weeks is to say, geez, you know, why don't we come up with an alternative um, reserve currency, having this special drawing rights concept at the IMF. Um, but I, I think that's kind of a, an ongoing dance that we can all sort of get used to and, and, and needn't become too big of an issue. Um, there's the old uh, joke that if you own a bank a million dollars, the bank o owns you. But if you owe the bank a billion dollars, you own the bank. And <laughs> so again, we're in this t together, I, I feel. I, I do think that. You know, there's this economic interdependence, um, which I can't overstate, at the same time that politically uh, we're not on the same page on so many different issues. And, you know, uh, as many people have pointed out, one of the dangers of hyping the G2 too much is that it antagonizes some of our other key allies in, in Asia and rivals to China. And it was interesting that when Hillary Clinton went to China, she first stopped over in, in Tokyo, a gesture that was uh, very appreciated there. Um, so, you know, uh, politically, we're, cl we're still more aligned in terms of our values and our interest with Korea and Japan and other powers in the region. And I think one of the, the, the tricks in terms of 
uh, managing this relationship and dealing with a lot of these structural issues isn't just on the economic side. I think it's, it's counterproductive if, if China harps too much on the reserve currency issue and we you know, clamor too much for devaluation as opposed to trying to work together on issues like, like North Korea, which don't you know, nominally affect the economic relationship. But I think it, if China could become a more responsible player and, and you know, really play the role that it ought to play given its, its, its uh, economic power and its true long-term interest, then I think we can all get more comfortable with the economic interdependence. I think one of the reasons why uh, we're very reluctant to embrace that reality in this country is that on the political side, there still is, seems to be this perceived gap. Uh, and I don't think that gap needs to be there, but it, but it is not notionally. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's probably the first mention we've had of, of Japan in this conversation today, which is, which is striking in and of itself. Japan, South Korea, uh, they both obviously are going to be key factors in, in whatever comes of, uh, you know, a sort of gradual shift toward the East. This is not a, a China-U.S. sole conversation, uh, G2 rhetoric. Notwithstanding, what, what do you make of that relative absence of, of Japan in the broader conversation about this uh, mention? Well, its economy is still, yeah. after all, the well, second largest. Oh, it's second world. largest, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, were inspired me uh, in writing this piece was mm -hmm. the experience of the late 80s. <laughs> mm -hmm. I really recommend you to read. Yeah. Uh, the journalist accounts, scholarly accounts of Japan, Japan is number one. All you need to do is to substitute Japan with China or Asia. Then you have a sense of the hype about Japan and now the hype about Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, second is that uh, Japan is not only demographically in decline. Mm -hmm. I mean, its politics is uh, more rebound. You look at uh, how uh, uh, a country that used to uh, grow economically, but uh, had a very uh, well, so ossified political system and, mm -hmm. and how that political system uh, really stopped serving its own people uh, mm -hmm. the, and the, uh, except for a very short period of time uh, uh, fell into a state of stagnation and uh, Japan is really a cautionary tale for China in, mm -hmm. the, in terms even if you uh, maintain very high rate, rapid, uh, high rates of economic growth. Uh, if you do not touch your political system in, a, a, at the end, mm -hmm. it, it will not serve. Uh, it will not serve your society well. For Japan, I I think the key is in politics. I mean, it has to have really good leaders. Has to have a different way of uh, electing their leaders. Uh, and uh, as a as a society, the, uh, again, I don't know enough about Japan to say, but. Uh, Japan just does not feel at this moment that uh, it has uh, the history on its side. <laughs> uh, it has this sort of di internal dynamism. But by and large, it's, it remains a very stable society, right. uh, despite 10 years of economic stagnation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, right now, it does not know where it belongs in Asia. Uh, used to think it belonged outside Asia. Mm -hmm. Now it wants to go back to Asia, but it's definitely Jap uh, Jap Jap Japan's leaders do not want to be second to China. Right. And that's where the problem is. Well, and that's uh, arguably uh, the case for Anders's uh, momentum theory, that it's not uh, overall what your per capita income is, for example, but your trajectory uh, that matters as much as, as, as much as anything. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the back there. Yes, Ira Shapiro, uh, Greenberg Traurig, former U.S. trade official. Um, this is a comment that may turn into a question, um, but I'd like to just suggest that Andreas is sounding a little too optimistic on this whole G2 interdependency. I certainly agree that we have a U.S.-China interdependency or what appears to be an interdependency that should work itself out well. But there are a couple of things that I think we need to focus on and, and I guess my, my particular expertise is more what we do and don't do in the U.S. effectively. But if you look at this interdependency, 
uh, I think I think there's some implicit assumption that still remains that kind of the U.S. will do the high-end stuff and China will be the low-cost manufacturer and that's going to all work out very well. And I think that's – you didn't say that, by the way, but I think there is an implicit notion there that I think there's no evidence of. I think it's going actually in quite a, a different direction, which is – that China, I believe, benefits enormously from the U.S. multinationals that have invested there, that have begun doing their R&D there. So they're benefiting from that, as well as the development of Chinese companies. And there's no real assumption in China that they're going to be confining themselves to anything like the low end. And so I think that's one important point. I think the second point is that I've been very impressed, uh, even in the climate change area, that China, with enormous problems, with overwhelming problems, is doing more, I believe, to start stepping up to these problems. One of my friends who knows a lot more about this than I do suggested to me the other day that China was really working very hard on carbon sequestration. When we talk about carbon sequestration, we talk about it year after year, but China's actually begin to build plants and really work on these kind of carbon capture things that might make a difference. So I guess the comment I would make uh, and my overall view of the last few years, I, I was once on a panel where I made some gloomy comments about the U.S. position and somebody said to me uh, afterward, you sound like you think the gradual decline of America is inevitable. And I said, who said anything about gradual? <laughs> um, because I don't think anything gradual has been happening in the last decade or so, which is one reason I'll close the comment simply by saying that the reason it feels like a historic moment in the United States is the question of whether the new administration, which is addressing so many fundamental issues, can really change the trajectory of our ability to deal with these problems. And I guess that's not a question as much as a comment. Sounds like we have a, a little bit of a dissenter from your, from your basic premise. Uh, uh, I think, uh, again, there are, uh, one is the economic uh, complementarity among between the two countries, the other economic, uh, climate change, energy efficiency. If you look at energy efficiency measures, the Chinese are clearly implement, uh, uh, producing more government guidelines, government policies, regulations. Uh, it's one thing, we, uh, if you know China well enough, you know that it's one thing for the government to issue sets of documents, guidelines, policies, and then saying whether these things the measures are actually carried out in general. So uh, we have to be a little bit more careful uh, looking at official rhetoric and then examining what actually goes on. Uh, I completely agree. Uh, this uh, uh, American high-end, Chinese no, low-end, the Chinese government at least does not want to be stuck at the low end. The Chinese government has very active industrial policies to promote high tech uh, and eventually to uh, acquire advantages of the competitiveness in key uh, sectors. Uh, the problem with, uh, the, with that initiative is that not many success stories have been created. Uh, on the other hand, uh, some Chinese private sector firms uh, have made very important uh, progress in becoming world leaders. There's one company, of course, uh, uh, there's a lot of controversy about the company. There's Huawei Technology, which is a telecom firm, not a government-owned company. Uh, it, has, it, it is now either number two or number three in the, the hardware telecommunications field. Uh, so uh, uh, I think looking forward, uh, you will see some success stories uh, in China that will uh, come about not because of government policy, but perhaps in spite of government policy. Mm -hmm. One Can thing I just say also, I, 
I, um, two things. I, I, you, you said I didn't actually say the low and high end, uh, but it is implicit in a lot of what we're talking about. I, I acknowledge that. Um, but I don't think that um, one's uh, sort of rosy view of this codependence is predicated on, an, on, an, on a view that China forevermore will be uh, you know, stuck in sort of being the low cost, lowest cost uh, manufacturing outpost for for the U.S. for U.S. multinationals. I, I think, in fact, uh, as the relationship matures, we you know to deal with some of the structural imbalances that were referred to earlier, we need China to to kind of, uh, and by China I mean not just the seaboard cities, but you know China at large to move up the chain and become more of a sort of truly middle income country. And I think that is partly the great hope and promise. Um, and Minchin might take issue with whether this will actually happen given a lot of the roadblocks. But I don't think the, uh, the success of the partnership is predicated in, in China staying where it is. It's, it's in fact that this will change um, and that, that the Chinese consumer will become the great sort of savior of, of you know, our industries and our exports. And you're starting to see, I mean, again, this is a very much in the early stages, but you're starting to see China lose some of its cost competitiveness, uh, you know, in Vietnam gaining some of that market share. And uh, certainly the country I grew up in, in Mexico, is hoping that China will start moving <laughs> up because a lot of the, the promise there of NAFTA was sort of stolen by China in this sort of G2 relationship. And also to your point about Nothing having happened gradually over the last decade, I, I, I do think this codependency uh, and this partnership is something that has evolved gradually. And I, but in, in some, I think it's interesting that it took this financial crisis to, uh, I mean, we didn't talk about the G2, you know, three or five years ago. It's suddenly, it's, it's as if people did wake up and say, geez, we're, we're really an integrated economy here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I don't think that my optimism uh, is based on a notion that China has to stay, you know, so far behind us in terms of per capita income. Mm -hmm. Do you have another question here in the front? Thank you. Uh, this is Jennifer Lee from the China Press. Uh, I have a problem about G2. I think uh, for the uh, Chinese government perspective, they, uh, they uh, uh, reluctantly to accept uh, the con conception of G2 because they think maybe uh, China is not uh, um, have the great power to compare with the United States. And uh, also, uh, the U.S. government seldom to uh, have any uh, comment on about G2, just uh, want to emphasize the U.S.-China cooperation. Yeah, and uh, I think it seems just like the G2 uh, on the academic level discussion from the think tanks, not from the government level. So is that uh, too over-evaluate the G2 conception, and what's the implication to, to other countries? I mean, for the Asia, maybe uh, 20 or 30 countries, and for the whole world, mm -hmm. will be uh, one, more than 150 countries. So uh, how do you think about G2 uh, impact for the whole world? Yeah, not only just the China or the United States. Thank you. I should have written another piece, the hype about you. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, going to be the follow-up. Uh, well, this is the hype I like. <laughs> yeah, the hype. Uh, well, uh, uh, as a, as a I, we should say it's, it's a very modest, uh, perhaps uh, inside the beltway type of hype. I don't think if you, uh, if you travel much outside 495, yeah. you're going to get a lot of people the, who are thinking the that the, the G2. Uh, 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 GM model. That's <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> a G2. Yeah, so. uh, well, uh, just some idle academics, uh, retired diplomats uh, have nothing else to do, and they coined that phrase, and the press picked it up, and they chewed it over, and somehow it seeped into this public discourse. Uh, you're right. Uh, the Chinese government does not endorse it. The U.S. government does endorse it. But why are we talking about this? Mm -hmm. this uh, well, there's obviously some, uh, something to be said for the two governments to get closer on a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. But to have a formal uh, status, a separate forum, uh, nobody likes the idea. Uh, I mean, I do think it's, I, do, I like it. Uh, <laughs> not as a formal. Obviously, yeah. you're not going to see a summit anytime soon. 
you know, with the big G2 banner in the background. Because, I mean, that would be a great way to antagonize, uh, you know, Everybody. 100 countries, as you said. <laughs> you know, you can imagine the British and, and, and in Asia especially. Um, but it does reflect the reality. Uh, you know, again, can you have any meaningful uh, advance on uh, global climate measures without China and the U.S. coming to some agreement? Um, in terms of the way out of the financial crisis, it, you know, it took China and the U.S. Uh, separately, but clearly with some conversations informally, uh, to uh, launch very aggressive stimulus packages in each country in a way that the Europeans weren't willing or, or didn't feel there was a need to do something similar. And there was a kind of general acknowledgement around the world that if Beijing and Washington you know, uh, both enact very strong uh, stimulus packages, that's, you know, three quarters of the battle in terms of getting the global economy back on its feet. So there is this, this force and this uh, relationship that is the locomotive of the global economy. And it's not just, it's not a unipolar world anymore to the extent that it might have been in the past. It's not the U.S. alone. But it is, so it's, it's these two economies. I mean, the G8 emerged as... Uh, this ritualized series of summits because there was this notion that if you had the eight leaders of these economies in a room, they could call the shots for everybody else. And clearly the G2, as much as, as it's an academic kind of inside the beltway term, is a pushback to that idea because I think the indispensable players on the global economy are not, you know, Italy, Canada, France, and the, the traditional leaders that attended G8 summits. Mm -hmm. Do we have another... Question. We have time for probably a couple more. Right here in the front. Hi, Sam Booth, um, student right now. Um, given, let, let's imagine continued economic headwinds, given China's self confidence, given um, disillusion with Western models, unlike 1989, what, um, in what direction do you see discontent going? Would you imagine democracy being just the next highest Maslow's hierarchy of need, that that would be a natural demand? Um, unlike the grassroots activism, which you mentioned earlier, it seems that it's mostly directed towards the specific injustice of a local official done wrong or a real estate developer or a chemical plant with little calls for having, your, having an actual election. Um, and therefore, do you see calls for democracy rising out of economic trouble or the less attractive sides of proud nationalism or other, perhaps a, a Marxist-inspired retrenchment? Why well, you can rule out the last <laughs> uh, possibility uh, right away. Uh, I do not believe that there is disillusionment with Western capitalism in China. There is... Uh, some kind of aha, uh, the teacher has made a horrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that the Americans, uh, who have been really the models for the Chinese, now have stumbled themselves. Uh, that does not mean that the model itself or uh, the market economy itself should be thrown out. Uh, they're thinking about uh, how to build a firewall around their financial system to prevent similar problems. Uh, in terms of social discontent, you're absolutely right. Right now, these are desperate, very specific, and uh, they, uh, these, uh, such, uh, the protest is not inspired by political ideals. But at some point, we don't know uh, when that will uh, be, political elites will exploit social discontent. When democracy comes to China, it will not be caused by, it will not be led by the masses. Okay? Rather, democracy will come as a result of some very ambitious, scheming, opportunistic politicians who know that he can exploit public discontent so that he himself can advance to the top. And by accident, democracy got created. <laughs> so well, this is my prediction. Well, note that uh, that Minchin is uh, adamant on the when democracy comes uh, to China and not if. Do you agree with that? Um, <coughs> what did John Lai say when? Uh, yeah. 
Kissinger asked him what he thought of the French Revolution. It's too soon to tell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> supposedly. Uh, you know, I, uh, yes, I can, I mean, one would like to think that democracy will eventually come. And again, partly depend, depends on how we define democracy. And, and, uh, and certainly you can point to a lot of uh, expansion of uh, private autonomy. Well, I think one thing that worries me more, though, um, you know, if we really did see a, uh, a severe economic crisis in China um, that were prolonged and quite different from what we've seen because, again, the resilience has been, uh, I think, quite striking. Um, but if, if there were a serious downturn, and the, then the, the, the whole, no, you know, the, the, the social c compact predicating what's been happening would be off. I mean, the, the sort of notion that we, the party, monopolize uh, power because we're going to give you 8 to 10 percent GDP growth, and you're all going to have cell phones, and, you know, we're going to beat the capitalist uh, uh, Westerners at their game. So if that were off, the, the sort of justification for the monopoly of power uh, would be gone. And I'm not sure that the next step would be uh, further democratization or you know, a, a grassroots movement that we could all applaud and hopefully not turn repressive. I, I would worry more about the, the other word that you inserted of nationalism and the extent to which the party would then have to f you know, quickly find another rationale, justification for its monopoly of power. And uh, that's where I think the bets could be off in terms of the sort of alignment of interests in China being a responsible kind of stakeholder in, in the current sort of the continuation of the Pax Americana, if you want to call it that. And there are certainly, you know, plenty, I mean, this is where Taiwan could, could play a role, or you can imagine any number of, of scenarios where the party could galvanize nationalism to justify its uh, continuation in power and and create the sense of encirclement and I mean I, I, <coughs> I I'm sure many of you have encountered this but again when you talk to young progressive cosmopolitan uh, Chinese in Shanghai and Beijing to me it's always quite striking how you know on Taiwan and Tibet uh, there's no daylight between the <laughs> most conservative <laughs> Politburo you know old timers and these you know 22-year-old uh, kids who just came back from college in the States. Mm -hmm. So there is something there that, that could be exploited. Mm -hmm. One thing we haven't talked about at all, which I, I hope you'll mention for everybody, is the demographic pressures yes. uh, that are going to increasingly come to pair, not only inside China, but uh, elsewhere. Okay. Japan is a great example. Yeah. And how that can shape outcomes in a way that we really uh, haven't yet considered as a factor yeah. in this conversation. It's often said, uh, demography is destiny. Right. And if you look at the demographics of Asia, except for India, Vietnam, maybe Indonesia, uh, and Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, most of the region will uh, have very poor demographic trends. Uh, Japan already has uh, entered an aging society, mm -hmm. and that's at the heart of its economic stagnation and decline. And China will uh, become an aging society in roughly 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, very rapid increase in people over 60s and 65. Uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, these dragon economies uh, already have under so-called replacement level birth rate. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, these fundamental, because uh, demographics uh, is a very powerful factor of economic growth. So if mm -hmm. you look at uh, the demographic trend and then uh, uh, think about the impact of aging society on savings, uh, on health care costs, on pensions, uh, then the Asia's economic growth will have to be discounted because uh, Asia has grown primarily because of high investment rates. Mm -hmm. Asia is a region with a lot of savings, and savings have driven the region's investment. It's unlike Latin America. Mm -hmm. Well, and of course, then there's also the dramatic uh, imbalance between Male men and, and women in, yes. uh, in China, which leads us right back to our consideration <laughs> of the future of macho, which is another <laughs> conversation. Uh, I think we have time for, for one or two more questions uh, here in the front. 
Uh, I, living in Washington, we kind of know how the American politics is shaped, you know, who the players. Uh, in China, it's kind of obscure, murky. My question is, does Chinese uh, government bureaucrats attract the, the brightest young kids? or uh, what is the, What's the quality of people making policies in China? Because all the policies are made in central government, you know, in a small room, I guess. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, good question. I would say that uh, if you, uh, so in terms of technical capacity, Chinese officials can be divided into two groups, the politicians and the technocrats. Mm. The technocrats are almost as good as technocrats anywhere, Japan, the US, uh, Western Europe. And when, you, when foreigners interact with Chinese technocrats, they're always impressed because these are the people who've traveled abroad, who've studied at prestigious universities, who know their fields very well. I think in China, the sector that exemplifies the best, ma uh, 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 this case is the financial sector. Chinese bankers, uh, mm -hmm. finan uh, Chinese central bankers are very, very good. The other type is politicians. And they, they are harder to figure out because uh, uh, they typically operate uh, behind the scenes, but they have the real power. Uh, policy is produced mostly as a compromise between politicians and technocrats. Technocrats always advance the most sensible policy ideas, and the politicians compromise, reach a compromise, uh, because they are more worried about politics, not about uh, real policy solutions. So by and large, I would say uh, politics in China today is more predictable than 30 years ago, uh, even though we don't know which individuals are going to lead China or govern a particular city. The overall structure of politics uh, is more stable. So individuals have very limited leeway in changing the structure. OK, why don't we have one last question then, all the way in the back. Hi, my name is Ali Wine. I'm a junior fellow uh, at the Carnegie Endowment. I guess I had uh, two related questions. Uh, one of them is that uh, there are growing calls for China and India to assume a level of global responsibility that's on par with their influence, and that involves you know, stewarding coali international coalitions to address global challenges. That involves intervening in situations to preserve or protect human rights and a whole host of other uh, global, sort of, uh, global responsibilities. Do you think that China and India are able, uh, as you know, since they're concerned about their power and their influence in increasing those, do you think that they are able and willing to assume those new uh, responsibilities as their power increases? So that's one question. The second question is that amidst this preoccupation of sort of the West versus China and India, or the West versus Asia, uh, I'm curious as to your perspectives on where the rest of the world sees itself fitting in, looking at the European Union, looking at other emerging powers, whether it's Brazil, Russia, South Africa, Indonesia, uh, where does the rest of the world see itself fitting in or does it see itself not fitting into this debate between or, uh, the West versus Asia? Where does the rest of the world see itself fitting in? Thank you. It's, uh, it's interesting when, uh, when you compare how the rest of the world treats India and China. Mm -hmm. uh, China is being called upon, there's an irony in this, China is being called upon to assume more global responsibility. You don't hear uh, India being called upon to, uh, to do heavy lifting. Uh, and, but at the same time, the world trusts India more than it trusts China, because China is a dictatorship. So the, uh, it is viewed constantly as a threat. India, on the other hand, is viewed as a much more trustworthy partner for the international community, even though it is less capable. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the rhetoric on uh, about China and India, you see this uh, difference very, very strikingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I um, you know, I think China is, you know, depending on the context, has a very kind of convenient uh, way of uh, selectively throwing its weight around, but more often than not saying, oh, we're, we're still a 
poor emerging country don't expect us to, you know, when Joe Bao recently said, you know, our contribution to the global economy and, and well-being is to grow our domestic market, sort of don't uh, bother us. And, and it, there's sort of this convenient, I think, over-reliance on the notion that we are all about sovereignty and are not going to play any leadership role in, uh, you know, trying to address problems in other countries. And so the, the, I, I think China's a bigger issue, looms far larger in these debates than India, not just because, uh, I, I think it had, a lot of it has to do with sort of its ability to veto measures at the, at the UN, for one, that, that India doesn't have. Um, and I did appreciate, uh, you know, uh, Minchin's piece pointed out that, you know, again, to talk about Asia as a, one entity, you know, when the, the interest of India and China just decide to, the, the two largest countries are so diametrically opposite on a range of issues. And so how you view these Asian powers as a third country depends a lot on, you know, if you, if you are uh, concerned first and foremost about protecting your farmers and, and not opening up to trade, you're, you're going to align your interests with India at the Doha round and, and not China. So it sort of depends where, where, where you are on a, on a range of issues. I do think that, again, the sort of jealousy about this, you know, proclaiming the uh, centrality of G2 is one reason we're not going to see a G2 summit and announced <laughs> as such anytime soon. I was struck in, in March going to uh, the Inter-American Development Bank meetings in Colombia, um, you know, a place where I didn't expect China to, to loom large, but in fact, you know, the most sought after audience at this convening of, of Latin American countries was an audience with the head of the Central Bank of China, and, and China was welcomed into the I IDB as a member. Um, and again, you see uh, across Latin America and Africa, people looking to China as a counterweight in terms of a, f a foreign investor. Um, and uh, you know that, how that narrative plays out and whether there are sort of political agendas that are brought to bear is, will be an interesting storyline to see because I, I do think that, uh, and again, this is one thing that augurs in the favor of U.S. interests globally there will always be some suspicion attached to uh, China's growing influence and, uh, you know, countries across Africa and Latin America are going to take Chinese money, but they're not necessarily going to feel that this is uh, somehow um, money that comes with less strings attached than the traditional flow from, from Uncle Sam. So, well, uh, In responding to your, uh, the second half of your question, I think the world at large is still trying to figure out how to deal with, take advantage of uh, Asia's rise. Yeah, it really depends on who you are. Uh, obviously, Africa welcomes this because they now have a, another source of aid, competition vis-a-vis -vis the West. Latin America partly welcomes this, depending mm -hmm. again on, on the kind of economic structures you have. Brazil. Uh, welcomes China and India's rise more than Mexico, which is more dependent on manufacturing. Uh, the more difficult challenges are for the U.S. and the West, because mm -hmm. here are two members, upstarts, Novohish, who would like to get into this prestigious country club. And they don't want to come in as junior partners. They mm -hmm. want to come in as due-paying full partners with all the benefits and privileges. Are you willing to have these two people who use not to enjoy much respect from you to be at the head table? I think this, the, world, the, the developed world is still trying to figure this out. I think uh, they've not made many mistakes so far, but I do not think they, have, they know anything about the end, uh, end goal or the, the end status. Well, I think that's a, a terrific note to wind up this conversation then. Thank you so much, uh, Minchin and Anders, and to all of you for coming out this morning. Really appreciate it. And uh, as I said, there are more copies of the magazine outside. Please uh, feel free to take some. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>